Have you ever wondered what the headstone designs, symbols, cherubs, and icons mean when you're visiting a cemetery? Can they help you with your genealogy? We're going to explore the historic icons found in graveyards and cemeteries in just a moment. But first, if you are new here, let me introduce myself. My name is Connie Knox. I am a lifelong genealogist here to help you go further, faster, and factually with your family research. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so that you get notified each time I upload a video. And if you like what I do, a thumbs up is always appreciated. And please share this about on your social media. Genealogy TV has a newsletter, a Facebook page, and a website. All of the links for all of that information are in the description below this video on the YouTube channel. Now, I picked historic Oakdale Cemetery in Wilmington, North Carolina, really because, well, its first burial was in 1855, and it has many beautiful and historic monuments there. And, well, what better place than to answer uh, one of the Genealogy TV Insider's requests for a video on the meaning of symbols found in tombstones and graveyards, grave markers. Uh, so as a side note, for those who are not aware, Genealogy TV Insiders is part of my monthly coaching sessions. If you want to learn more about that, you can go to Genealogy TV Insiders page on the website at genealogytv.org forward slash insiders. So Debbie, one of our insiders, this one's for you. Okay, well, I picked Oakdale Cemetery because I know the superintendent there, Eric Cozen, and he has helped me out in the past on other videos, and well, he's quite knowledgeable. So I asked him if he could help answer Debbie's questions about the symbols and gravestones uh, and what they mean and how we can learn more about them. Well, <laughs> Eric loves this stuff. So uh, we walked around Oakdale uh, and he just kind of ran with it. So here's what he had to say. Well, in cemeteries, cemeteries actually have a lot of different types of symbols, um, and they range from anywhere from flowers to animals. Uh, probably one of the top um, symbols within a cemetery is the dove with the olive branch in its mouth. Um, if we look at how the dove is with the olive branch, we can all go back to the story of Noah when he passed out the uh, uh, dove to go find land and this is something that actually means um, the forgiveness of God because the uh, dove returned with an olive branch in its mouth showing that land was somewhere. So what we have here are tree stones and tree stones are what I consider kind of a fad within cemeteries. These are made out of limestone and typically you would find tree stones within cemeteries from about 1880 uh, to about 1920. They also have additional uh, iconography also on them, which are, it's ivy. So typically ivy you would find um, kind of in, in anybody's landscape, but typically when you find ivy associated with a tombstone, it actually has the three points of the leaves, which actually uh, represent the Trinity. But with ivy, we all know that it's very difficult to get rid of in our gardens, so it's very um, persistent. And so on stones, when it's actually climbing and clinging to it, it shows that divinity towards God and everything else along with that. Here we have another tree stone. So think of tree stones as like um, if you went out and bought yourself a new house, you went to a nursery, and you planted the tree. So we plant this tree, we water it, we fertilize it, we nurture it, we'll prune it. And then over years, the tree grows and gets bigger and bigger. Well, in life, it's the same situation. So uh, we bear children, we nurture our, child, our children, and we're able to watch them grow and learn things. But unfortunately, life has a certain sense of tragedy. And the way that could be represented within a cemetery is sometimes through tree stones. So here we have a tree stone that the tree has been grown, <clears throat> that unfortunately all the branches have now been severed and it shows that something tragic has occurred. And so this actually denotes that one's life was actually cut short. And if we see here, an epitaph has been placed on here with this roping and this, this uh, scroll here, showing that this gentleman here dies at the early age of 26 years old. Okay, here we have another tree stone. This tree stone here actually denotes an organization. Organization is known as Woodmen of the World. One of the things that they had done uh, when they started their organization back in 1890 was that if you were a member of Woodman of the World, you were afforded a tombstone, which actually would look like a tree. Um, it is actually just a big tree trunk. It actually has their symbol right here, Woodman in the World in the middle. 
and it's basically laid up on another bed of logs here. But it's to identify you um, that you were part of this organization. So if you were coming to the cemetery to visit, you would actually be able to notice that this gentleman was part of the Woodman of the World. So here we are at another gravestone, which actually indicates something else that was very similar to what I had mentioned earlier about the tree stones and the shortage of life. Just as with trees, we plant flowers and stuff like that in the springtime. So we go to our local nurseries, we buy flowers, we plant them around our house. Sometimes the flowers are fairly young. So again, we water them, we nurture them, we fertilize them. We get this big, beautiful bloom that, that arises. But unfortunately, as we see here closely with this monument here, that the bloom has come up, is opened up to a beautiful flower, but there's an intentional break that has been taking place with the stem. That shows that something tragic has occurred. And as we look down here with her name and dates, we see that she dies on August 8th, 1882, at the tender year of age, 14 years and seven months. It's actually strange on here because they just have her death date. They do not have her birth date. So you have to do the mathematics in regards to figuring out um, when she was actually born. So here I want to show the individuality of monuments. Uh, during the antebellum period, basically starting really roughly right after the Civil War, um, between the Civil War and about 1900, monuments that were erected were really erected for individuals. And as we see behind me, the array of monuments, they're all different sizes, colors, and shapes. During the turn of the century of 1900, monuments had changed and they had actually gotten a little bit smaller and they went down to something a little bit, that's what's behind me here, that we see that shows oh, it's only about three or four feet in height. If we move forward about another 20 to 30 years, the memorial parks kind of came into the cemetery world. And so all those monuments are flat and flush to the ground. Then we have something new that's occurring today with cremation. So let's think about this. We started out in the antebellum period with having these big, beautiful monuments that were towering sometimes eight, 10, 15 feet in height to moving to the 1900s where the monuments got a little bit shorter and then even got flat to the ground. So we've progressed from something very tall to something medium to now flat on the ground to now when I ask most people, how many people are actually going to be cremated? If I ask a group of 20, about 18 hands go up. Of those 18 hands that I ask that go up, how many of you will actually end up in a cemetery? And I typically get one or two hands. So that basically means that there's no monument at all. Okay, so here we have another example of a tree stone. And a lot of times you can just go with, with its very obvious state in nature. It's a very small tree stone. So this would typically denote that it is a tombstone for a child. And again, we still do find a dove that's actually placed on, onto this tombstone, but it has passed as well. Most children's graves would actually be adorned with a lamb. The lamb is typically the, the symbol of innocence and purity. So we see here with this tombstone, the lamb that's actually placed upon a bed of rocks with a cloth or a blanket that is scrolled down over top of it, which actually has the epitaph. Rocks are also another symbol of monuments where it is strength. It is the foundation. And so a lot of times we can consider children being the foundation of our families. So here we have a couple different things. One, I wanna talk about this beautiful angel that we have seated here. The angel, as you can see, does bear wings. Um, she is actually a solid piece of marble, but angels are something fairly new to cemeteries, especially being in the antebellum period. Prior to the antebellum period, if you would have gone into the old church graveyards, the symbols that you would have seen on tombstones would have been the skull and crossbones. It wasn't until the antebellum period, shortly after the Civil War, that those skull and crossbones actually gained flesh and became angels and cherubs alike. So you'll find a lot of angel type figures within cemeteries that were developed from 1850 on onward. We also have another thing that she's actually seated on. Most people call these a bench, but in cemetery terms, we actually call these exedras. And an exedra is just a fancy word for a bench. Um, but typically, these exedras were utilized within cemeteries um, for ages, even going back into the Grecian times, where just like here in America, most cemeteries were typically created on the outskirts of town. And so with those weary travelers going to the grave sites, they actually needed a place to rest. 
but not only a place to rest, but they would actually leave offerings of food, wine, and liquids, and so forth. Just like we leave little trinkets and flowers and things of that nature. But in America, these exedras were born into our, our cemetery spaces, roughly again about the same time frame as the antebellum period. But what happens is that when you think of these exedras being in cemeteries, cemeteries were having a battle between not only the families that were coming out here to enjoy um, the beauty of the cemetery, but also to visit their family and loved ones, but you also had people coming from the city. And the city were com people from the city were coming out here and enjoying the proper property, doing recreational activities. So there became a little bit of a clash between families and visitors. And so the visitors were actually being kicked out of the cemeteries and not allowed to come into the property to enjoy them. So what happened there? If you think of a cemetery with all these monuments and so forth and you remove them all, what do you have? A park. That's how our parks became developed as a simple result of people wanting to do recreational activities outdoors. But they took some of the thoughts and ideas of the cemeteries and incorporated within our parks. So we have a lot of our older parks that have these large seating areas, which are called exedras. Another unique item that you'll see on this exedra is an inverted torch. So if you actually take a torch and you invert it, it actually extinguishes itself. And so that is the, its symbolic gesture, as well as a wreath of laurel, which is also very victorious within sim, uh, symbolism and so forth. So here we have another figure. This is known as a pleuron. It is not an angel because it does not bear wings. But as we see her, she's got her right hand upon an anchor. Most people would consider that that they were seafaring. But anchor is one of the top symbols of hope. And as we see this figure looking towards the heavens and her left hand upon her breast, we have this hope and this transition of going from life to death, from earth to heaven. Another thing about pleurons and angels is they are all typically of female nature. Here we are at the monument of William H. Bernard. Here on William's stone, there's a couple things I want to point out. One is this <clears throat> raised lettering, and we also have this symbol that's up here that's actually what, they, what we call a bas relief. This symbol here is what I'm, most people would consider a feather. But watch when I do this. Now easily, it becomes available now. So we have here a quill. So what do we do with a quill? We write. What's quite interesting, especially being on a tombstone, that this symbol is actually on here. But when we sit here and we look at his name, <clears throat> this is all raised lettering. So we see here it's William Bernard. He's born January 1st, 1837. And he dies February 22nd, 1918. Something was added much later. As we see this, this is blasted into the stone to make this job a little easier. See, it says here that he is the founder of the Morning Star, our local newspaper. So what we have here is a couple different markers. Shortly after the Civil War, the United Daughters of the Confederacy decided that they wanted to mark every single soldier's gravesite with a marker indicating <clears throat> that they served within the Confederate States Army. So here we have the marker it just says CSA, which stands for Confederate um, States of Army. And then we just have his first couple of initials and his last name, just to identify where he is. And this is typically placed at the foot of his gravesite. As time has moved forward a couple a hundred years or so, the United Daughters of Confederacy started marking gravesites of these gentlemen and actually providing a lot more information, sometimes showing that he was a private, um, depending on which company he was in, and so forth. But the interesting thing about this is which date is correct. Here we have his death date of being February 19th, 1918. And on his tombstone, it says February 22nd, 1918. I always ask people, where do you find your genealogical information? Some people will tell me the family Bible, um, court records, and so forth. But they're missing the entire picture, cemeteries. Why cemeteries? Because the information is so prevalent on tombstones. This guy here in particular, this is George. He is the second son, not the first son, but he is the second son of George and Kate. Again, they show here when he dies on November 30th of 1873. And he's aged 13 years, 10 months, 
and 20 days old. Again, we don't have a birth date, but we have all those days in between. So now let's go and talk about one of George's sisters. Okay, here we have the monument of Maggie Murkison. She is also a Pleurant, leaning against what we call a rustic cross and a beautiful garland of flowers. But for genealogical purposes, we could see down here that we have her full name, Maggie Murkison, and she's the wife of, so now we have additional information, of W.W. W. Holiday, and she's the daughter of George and Kate Williams. She dies on September 21st of 1889. She was aged at 24 years and 25 days. So here we have another angel. And as we can see here that she actually does bear wings. So we see in this one hand that she's holding a quill. What do we do with a quill? We write. We see her other hand over here atop a book. So we have this beautiful inquisitive look. So what do little girls do with pens and books? Write in our diaries, right? So here we sit amongst in this thought trying to figure out what we might be writing. But as we see her hand is placed on top of this book, what happens when you put your hand on top of a book? You're preventing it from what? The page is turning. Life has stopped. So as you see her hand on top of this book, there's other books that you could also find within cemeteries. Sometimes they will be closed, which basically denotes, again, the story is done, it's over, the end. Or sometimes you will find on the book that it actually has a cross, which would denote that it's a Bible. One of the questions I get asked a lot is, what is IHS? There's a couple different, uh, I guess, questionable meanings in regards to it. One of them could mean that it could mean in Latin, in hoc signia, but it actually isn't. IHS actually are the very first three letters of Jesus' name in the Latin alphabet. Etne, hocne, signia. So one would think that most people would consider the letters RIP as being very prevalent within cemeteries. But to be honest with you, there's probably close to about 15,000 monuments over the entire acreage of Oakdale Cemetery. And I can emphatically tell you that there's only one RIP that I have been able to find out of all those monuments. Most actually say at rest or just sleeping or something to the effect. Occasionally you'll find it in Latin, which would be requisite and pace. So here we have something that's gonna be a little bit different symbolized onto a tombstone, hands. Um, if you look closely, you could actually tell that one is actually female and the other is male. But this monument here basically denotes that we had the farewell uh, loss of, of this gentleman's wife. And so we could see these hands that are clasped together, which could also denote that they were pretty much inseparable. Hands could also have a different form and fashion, where a lot of times the hands are pointing upward. Everything is about going up into heaven. Don't go away. I have more information for you in just a moment. Well. We could have done this all day. We had such a blast walking around, looking at all the little symbols and icons found on tombstones and grave markers of various kinds. So I have more information for you. Eric shared with me a book called Stories in Stone, a field guide to cemetery symbolism and iconography. Uh, it is written by Douglas Keister. I will leave a link in the show notes on how to get that. Uh, it's available on Amazon. I will leave an affiliate link for you there. Eric also mentioned that um, Oakdale Cemetery on their website has a whole section devoted to the symbolism found in tombstones right there on their website. It is a free resource. It is really cool. I will make sure that you have a link for that as well. And I also found some uh, a reference to military symbols on tombstones. So I will leave a link for that as well. All right, so also know that all these links that I'm providing are typically in the blog post at genealogytv.org. So make sure you're checking that out and uh, a lot of times in the newsletter as well. Uh, thank you, Eric, for taking the time to help make this video. I really appreciate it. If you'd like to make a donation to the friends at Oakdale, links are in the show notes below. If you'd like to donate to Genealogy TV, become a patron, or join the insiders, links for all of that are in the show notes below. I've got more information about cemeteries and what you can find in them on the screen for you right now. But right now, it is time for you to go find your ancestors. So until next time, keep on climbing your family tree.